Okay, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know it's a small audience. It's June, <laughs> getting ready for graduation and all of our normal end of the year activities. And I know some of you are tuned in online. I'm Craig Chai. I'm the Senior Medical Director for our Global Outreach Division. And on behalf of Lori McCoy, our director, we want to welcome you to our multi our Moran Subspecialty Grand Rounds regarding Global Outreach. So this year was an exceptional year for us. Not only did we have one, but we actually had three Global Ophthalmology Fellows. And it was actually the first year that we've had three subspecialty trained ophthalmologists as well. So we're, we were really thrilled to have three exceptional individuals to be able to give of themselves and their, and to be able to use their skills and talents uh, to serve our global outreach community. So first I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Sean Galati. Many of you remember Sean. He was here for a long time as our global or as our glaucoma fellow, as well as our global fellow. You didn't get to see him much during his Global Outreach Fellowship, though, and he'll tell you why in a little bit. But Sean comes to us by way of uh, Midwest. He did his undergraduate degree at Michigan, an MPH at Hopkins, his MD at William Beaumont, and then residency at UIC before matriculating here to the Moran. So, Sean, this is your time now. We look forward to your presentation. And then after your presentation, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Sounds good. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be with you all today. Um, I'm now in Chicago. Hopefully I see some of you in Chicago for Academy, but definitely let me know when you're uh, around. So I'll start by, uh, so this is the wa famous welcome sign at Arvind Pondicherry. I'm going to talk about a couple of the sites that I went to during my Global Ophthalmology Fellowship. So I wanted to focus my talk on systems-based care. It's very difficult to put into put a six month global ophthalmology fellowship uh, into words in, in 10 to 12 minutes. But I wanted to focus on probably my biggest takeaway from my global ophthalmology fellowship from especially, which was kind of championed by these two institutions, uh, systems-based care at uh, Arvind Eye Hospital and Vishwalisa Eye Clinic. So my global ophthalmology fellowship, and the reason why you didn't see me as Dr. Chai was referring to uh, during my fellowship was um, you know, very internationally focused. Uh, I started at Bugando Medical Center in Mwanza, Tanzania, which I was mo mostly focused on teaching glaucoma surgery. Then I went to Arvind Eye Hospital in Pondicherry, India, where I was uh, doing the SICS course and SICS uh, training there. Um, then I went to Chuuk State Hospital in Micronesia, where I was um, you know, seeing patients. We were teaching FACO, uh, doing FACO, SICS, and tridium surgery. And then I uh, concluded my uh, fellowship at Visualisa Eye Clinic, where you know, I was teaching MIGS, uh, as well as doing SICS and learning SICS uh, with them, as well as helping them, you know, get resources to start a residency program, which they're planning to start in 2024. So, so there's limited overlap between the other global ophthalmology fellows. I'm going to focus on Arvind Eye Hospital and Vishwalisa Eye Clinic. So first, I also feel a little bit of uh, guilt. I, I am not the right person to give you a full breadth of information about either of these institutions. Um, they you know go back many, many years. And if you want more information, I'm only part of the story, but I'm just going to focus on what I learned from these institutions. So starting at Arvind Eye Hospital, this is a institution that was founded decades ago with uh, a mission of providing low cost, high quality and high volume eye care. Um, we focus, you know, we as ophthalmologists um, in America, we have the privilege in, in practicing in a, in a setting where, you know, cost is often not part of the discussion. We do focus on providing high quality care, but, um, you know, Arvind Eye Hospital with a, with a mission and a focus on delivering, you know, free care to many patients, low cost care becomes critically important in order to deliver you know, care to the masses. So that impacts their systems, both, you know, as a whole, as well as their surgical systems. So we don't talk about uh, small incision cataract surgery very often. So I did want to spend some time talking about uh, the systems involved in, in this surgery, as it, as you guys obviously know, you know, cataract surgery, number one cause of surgical curable blindness. Um, so delivering that care to a high uh, number of people at a low cost, um, you know, needs to be designed in such a way to achieve those goals. So SICS, you know, comparatively to FACO, which, you know, can be, is a very high quality surgery and can be done at a high volume, you know, it is certainly not a low cost surgery. So to, de 
to design a surgery that, that can address cataract blindness um, at a low cost is critical. And SICS is able to accomplish that. So I'm going to show, so the way that the SICS course at uh, Arvind Eye Hospital is designed is, you know, you show up, this is Arvind Eye Hospital in the Pondicherry on the left. This is my trainer who I was lucky to work with, Dr. Naveen. Um, and this is me on the right doing uh, cataract surgery. Um, so it's designed where you show up and, you know, depending on your previous training um, and certainly you should, you know, pre-read the materials and, and go to the wet lab before starting training, but then you're kind of, uh, you know, you start off doing two plus NS type of well-dilated cataracts. And then, you know, eventually uh, you can progress to doing, you know, brown cataracts or um, small pupil cases as well. So I'll go on to show a surgical video. Hopefully this, you know, comes through uh, over Zoom. I'm not sure if you caught that first part, but this is a brown cataract. And in that in very first step, while I was bringing the microscope into view, you could see uh, a 4 silk uh, bridal suture placed under the superior rectus. And that helps to provide uh, this introduction of the globe, which many people um, do not do, which is just fine. But especially for these denser cataracts, it can be, you know, a very important step of the surgery. And if an institution who's providing such high volume uh, care, who cares to do it at a low cost, if they're putting that suture in, in every patient, you, you, you should think that that can be a critical step. So uh, next we made our conjunctival peritomy. We used cautery. And then now I'm going and using my crescent blade to, you know, create my scleral tunnel, which, you know, I then confirmed I'm going side to side with the incision. I wanted to show this surgery, especially for the trainees in the audience who may not get too much exposure or any exposure to SICS surgery and just how, um, you know, what the surgical steps are entailed. And even in the United States where we have access to FACO for basically any patient we uh, want, you know, doing cataract surgery uh, on a dense or brown or black cataract, they do come up and, you know, I, and this is, you know, going to be extremely friendly on the corneal endothelium because you're not putting any of that ultrasound energy into the eye. So next we go in with our keratome. Uh, I'm doing uh, the can opener uh, style of capsulotomy, which is, again, not very commonly used. Another reason why I wanted to show this video. Uh, I'm less fast at doing this procedure than uh, my colleagues at Arvin. So I'm, you know, re- uh, uh, putting viscoelastic into the anterior chamber, um, and then going and finishing the capsulotomy with the, with the cystotome. Um, after completing that, we'll uh, perform hydrodissection. Because this is a brown cataract, many times the, the brown cataracts can be, you know, very adherent to the, to the corneal endothelium. So one uh, trick, instead of just prolapsing this directly into the anterior chamber, is that you can use a Sinsky hook and kind of dial out uh, the cataract um, over a cyclodialysis spatula. Um, that can be more friendly to the bag, you know, and preserving the bag so that you're able to place uh, a PMMA or whatever your IOL of choice is into the capsular bag. Um, so next I'm using an irrigating vectus, and you can't see this, but with my left hand, I'm pulling that, um, that, uh, that silk suture as I'm uh, uh, completing that nucleus delivery. And that's oh. here. Sorry, was somebody saying something? So that suture can help to introduct the globe so that you're able to put posterior pressure on the posterior aspect of the wound and kind of prevent that lens from scraping along the corneal endothelium. Now I'm going in with the Simcoe cannula, removing uh, any remaining cortex. Uh, with these brown cataracts, there tends to not be much cortex. Um, and next I'm going to put in the intraocular lens and these are PMMA, uh, single piece lenses, which do have these dialing holes, which are made by Oralab, um, which can, uh, be very helpful in dialing in, uh, the lens into the capsular bag. So then you just put in a hook and, you know, kind of dial it into the, into the bag there. I think next I just remove the viscoelastic and then we, uh, we'll use a uh, bipolar cautery to, um, you know, close the wound here. I can kind of fast forward a bit here. So basically after removing the viscoelastic, you can then use uh, cautery to uh, close your peritomy. 
Um, and yeah, that's the end of the case. So next, I just wanted to talk about larger systems as opposed to just the, the surgical system that's involved in obviously their most high, high volume surgery. So the way Arvin the Eye Hospital is designed is that there's a free section um, and a paying section. And it's up to the patient to decide, you know, wherever they would like to go, you know, no background or insurance information is, is uh, gathered. It's up to them to decide, you know, which part of the hospital do they want to go to. Um, another part of their sustainability is their sustainability, which is very impressive. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't show, uh, the trash cans that we have in the OR, but basically all our big trash cans that we fill after one case in the U S it's that probably is greater than the cases that they do over the whole day, which can, can comprise of, you know, over 400 cases. Uh, it's a single use plastic free campus. Here are their solar panels, which are used to, you know, get energy. And uh, Dr. Venkatesh actually, you know, visited Moran in Salt Lake City, and he has a really, really good talk on, on YouTube and on Moran Core, um, if you're interested in learning more about their sustainability initiatives. Uh, so this is a hospital map. Uh, so on the left, if, if Cole Swiston's in the audience, he may, may recognize this map. This is from the uh, Arvin guest house in Madurai. Um, so the very, this is a map of India in the very bottom orange state. That's the uh, state of Tamil Nadu, which is basically, you know, all of where uh, Arvin is doing their work. Um, they have, you know, many uh, hospitals and then many, many more uh, vision centers. So this is a map of their hospitals and they, I believe they have 110 vision centers, which are kind of surrounding each one of these hospitals. So for patients that need to be referred for specialty care or for surgical care, they're then, um, you know, sent to one of these hospitals for, for additional care. This is me when I visited uh, Madurai. This is the chairman, Dr. RD, and this is Orlab. Another way that they were able to, you know, really uh, bring low cost care is to develop their own lab, which manufactures their own intraocular lenses, sutures, medications. Um, that has really enabled them to deliver low cost care for themselves, as well as for you know our other international partners who who purchase products from from our lab at a low cost. Uh, this is some some of the coursework that I was teaching with them about glaucoma to the trainees, um, and I'll end my part about uh, Arvind to, with this quote from uh, Dr. V, to see all as one, to give sight for all. Um, and if you wanna learn more, I highly encourage, especially the trainees to read this book called Infinite Vision, how Arvin became the world's greatest business case for compassion. You know, something that's studied in, in business schools, as well as, you know, this book really does a great job of highlighting, you know, the his history and, you know, how they're able to deliver, you know, these high quality systems for, for the masses. So how do I transition from talking about that to Vishalisa? Uh, this story, it really just shows how small of a, of a world we live in. Uh, thankfully, I have a very natural transition. So the gentleman on the left is Dr. Venkatesh. He's the chief medical officer and the head of the Arvin in Pondicherry. So he's who I worked with um, uh, in Pondicherry. And it just so happens that um, Dr. Yi, who not, Dr. Nico Yi, who I'm sitting with on an airplane in Guatemala here on this photo on the right, uh, he and his brother Mariano Yi, they went to uh, Arvin in Madurai 20 years ago and trained with Dr. Venkatesh. So it just really showed the coincidence and the um, small world we live in. So they both went to Arvin Pondicherry, and now they're uh, back. Uh, in Guatemala. And, you know, they were the first people, uh, according to Dr. Nico Yi, who did SICS in Central America and potentially in South America as well, since they went to, you know, Arvin Eye Hospital decades ago. So uh, Vishalisa is also very impressive in the systems that they were able to build. Uh, it's very uh, similar to Arvin that they have these uh, central hospitals with many uh, surrounding vision centers that, uh, you know, then refer to um, the hospitals for advanced care or for surgical care. So this is kind of a map that they have on their website of all the different places that they are uh, now located. I spent the majority of my time in Guatemala City, um, but I was also able to visit um, Paten, which 
we use this plane, which is they used to uh, take a bus for 11 or 12 hours, taking, you know, people, equipment to visit the clinic and pretend. But now they actually the clinic themselves purchased a plane to be able to get there and, you know, uh, 30 minutes to an hour and bring, you know, up to six people with their supplies. So just going further into systems. Um, so this was a very, I think this is my biggest takeaway from uh, working at Visualisa was the systems that they were able to build, not only in, um, you know, delivering surgical care, SICS care to, to many patients, um, but they also have this very impressive system. So on the very left, there's the an ambulance, which the clinic, uh, you know, can send out for patients needing uh, urgent or emergent care. Uh, they have this uh, shuttle van, which can bring people from uh, the vision centers or from across the city uh, to the actual hospital for care. They have these uh, medication delivery motorcycles, which uh, sends um, medications out to patients throughout the city so they don't need to come to the main hospital for their medications. And then on the far right is this diabetic center where they have, they actually, I, this is the first time I've seen this. They have retina doctors working side by side with their internal medicine doctors or endocrinologists to, you know, provide, you know, comprehensive uh, diabetic care to a patient in, in one facility. So they're getting, you know, PRP or diabetic treatment from their retina doctors at the same time that they're visit, they're getting their systemic diabetic treatment as well. Um, this is me on the plane uh, visiting the uh, place in uh, Paten. And then this is, you know, I uh, won't do it justice by talking about everybody, but uh, there was, uh, you know, many uh, people as part of the team. This is a picture of um, a large number of people in the team, including um, the photo on the right is the uh, glaucoma folks that I was working with and, you know, teaching um, MIGs to them and uh, learning from them as well. So uh, with that, I'll uh, hand it off back to Dr. Chaya. Um, I'll see you guys in Chicago. This is where I currently am now. Thanks so much for your time. John, thank you so much for sharing. What would you say is an important takeaway point now that you're back in a new practice environment in Chicago? What are some lessons that you learned in during your Global Ophthalmology Fellowship that you think are applicable to your daily practice there in Chicago? Can you hear us? You're muted, John. Oh, okay. Ethan's going to open it up just a sec. Okay, you should be able to unmute. You're good, Sean. You can speak. Um, so that's a very complicated question. Um, so I would say for the most part for me in wanting to continue to do uh, global ophthalmology work, you know, I'm, uh, and now I'm also at an academic uh, center. Um, so I've started to, you know, work with some of the residents and planning to continue to do global ophthalmology work, you know, potentially, you know, having them accompany me when we go to Tanzania next year, as well as working with the Robert Havey Global Health Institute, which is I included on the on the previous slide, you know, to try to establish uh, a global ophthalmology presence at Northwestern, which um, is not uh, a current, a big focus um, as of yet. You know, with my practice and my patients, um, I would say the biggest takeaway I would say is, you know, learning to think on the fly and be um, more comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Um, you know, I texted, you know, many of the current uh, residents and and fellows and, and Craig Chai knows this as well. You know, when you're at Moran, you are spoiled to the nth degree in terms of the surgical equipment that you have available and the excellent staff that you have available. Uh, so when you go from that setting to any other setting, you know, you have to be, you know, more comfortable in, in being creative with the equipment that you have and, you know, trying to devise solutions. So I would say that's probably my biggest takeaway. I think every global ophthalmology fellow will tell you that you learn to be uh, uncomfortable and find creative solutions. Um, so I would say that's probably my biggest takeaway as well as, you know, taking the SICS skills and, you know, deploying them when I do come across a, a dense cataract. Any questions for Sean? Sean, thank you. So oh, Watson, go ahead. So I think you said you did a beer can opener capsulotomy. Is that correct? I missed the question. Dr. Olson was commenting that you were doing a can opener capsulotomy. He was just commenting on that. That's correct. 
So in the, it, back when when that's you know what we did, one of the big problems is is you often ended up with one haptic in the sulcus and one in the bag because it would tear out or you weren't exactly sure. Is is that something you've been able to avoid now? Because that's one of the reasons why everybody was so excited about capsulorexis to avoid that problem. So I would say for that, that is an uncommon way that I was doing SICS. Over the, the overwhelming majority of cases, I was doing a traditional CCC with the cystotome, just kind of dragging that uh, uh, rexus across. Uh, benefits of doing this are for, you know, for large lenses, for dense lenses, um, delivering uh, the lens out and kind of having those uh, micro tears. Uh, the folks at Arvin thought that that would give, a, a, you know, additional, you know, space to deliver the lens outside of the bag but that is a critical point um you know there's two there's two big problems that can come across one i noticed that uh you know as you're aspirating cortex you have to be extremely certain that you're only aspirating cortex otherwise you can cause one of those micro tears to another one. that was another one <laughs> and, and and then a second issue is the one you mentioned where you know, as you're Im implanting the lens if that haptic isn't going directly into the capsular bag, it can also cause, you know, a tear to radialize. So you have to just be, you know, very careful in where you're delivering it. So for that reason, um, I would still employ a traditional CCC, like we learned, whether it's with assistatome or, or uh, with utrata forceps, whatever, whichever way is fine. But there were uh, a small number of cases where we did employ this, mainly in dense cataracts. And also just for me, who has never done a can opener and wanting just to gain that experience. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is actually tuning in with us. She's in the Netherlands currently. She's at the Neuro Ophthalmology Society meeting in the Netherlands, but we are going to, we pre-recorded her presentation just in case there was a poor connection. So I, Aishwarya Sriram was one of our other global ophthalmology fellows and our first neuro ophthalmology trained fellow. And we were really pleased about her skill set because so much of what we need in the world is better education for many of our partners. Aishwarya completed her bachelor's degree at University of Virginia in Hopkins. She then went on to do her MD degree uh, in, uh, in on the East Coast and was a resident at Montefiore Einstein for her residency and then Mass Ioneer for her Neuro-Ophthalmology Fellowship. So we'll go ahead and start her presentation, then she'll be tuning in live for questions. Good morning, everybody. My name is Aishwarya Sriram, and I was one of the Global Fellows this past year. I'm excited to share with you all a little bit about my fellowship. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I hope that uh, this PowerPoint uh, is enjoyable. Uh, disclosures, I'm currently working at a med tech startup called Machine MD. So for my presentation, I'll go over uh, an overview of my year. I'll talk about two of the main sites I visited in Sub-Saharan Africa through SWOT analysis type format, and then I'll talk about some professional and personal takeaways. So first, the overview. I began my fellowship at Instituto Mexicano de Ophthalmología. This was in Querétaro, Mexico. I was there between September and October of 2023. Um, as you can see from the photos, I had the opportunity to um, work with the residents and teaching um, via didactics and in the clinic. I had the opportunity to go on several outreaches that I've included some of the photos and perform surgery, um, strabismus surgery, which I was trained in in my previous fellowship and learning some small incision cataract surgery as well. After that, I went to Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology in Kathmandu. I was there between October and December of 2023. Um, I had the chance to go on a few outreaches, which I've included some photos here, work with the uh, peds, strabismus op uh, ophthalmologists, um, so there's a photo from the OR, and then teaching the residents again, uh, there's a photo with all the residents. And now I'll talk about uh, two of the other sites I visited thereafter. Um, one was in Ghana and one was in Tanzania. So first we'll uh, start the SWOT analysis with the hospital in Kumasi, Ghana. This is Compo Noche Teaching Hospital and I was there in January of 2024. So some of the strengths of uh, the program there. So I definitely uh, appreciated that there were a lot of eager learners and bright young faculty. Um, the residents were really motivated to learn. Um, I was teaching them neuro-ophthalmology and general ophthalmology through lectures by working with them in their clinics. And uh, I really enjoyed the questions that they asked. And I thought that they 
Uh, we're thinking critically about the conditions and uh, we're generally motivated. So that's a great quality. Um, there is also a wide range of pathology. Uh, I would say there was pretty much nobody there for a routine exam or for refraction. Um, most people had significant pathology, um, which is, uh, of course, a good opportunity for learning for both the residents and for um, any visitors. Um, so that's a strength of the program is that there's definitely diversity in pathology. Um, there's also generally positive and collegial culture among everyone that's working there. Um, you can see the bottom photo was with all of the residents and the, uh, the faculty, and uh, it was just a really warm, welcoming environment. And I'm really um, glad that they have that type of environment and type of culture. Uh, and then lastly, I noticed that there was a good mix of autonomy and supervision for the residents. So they have their own clinic. Um, they're able to see patients on their own, but there are junior faculty or fellows available there to help staff the patients. Um, or I was there, for example, to staff the cases. So there's a good mix um, for them with autonomy and supervision, in my opinion. Um, the weaknesses of the program, and of course, um, these weaknesses are uh, taken into the broader context of lim the limitations in the region and in the country, so they're not in any way to critique the program, but just um, areas where the program could improve and um, where the collaborations, uh, for example, could help um, utilize um, uh, our strengths and their strengths and collaborate to uh, improve the program overall. So there's overall a low surgical volume. I would say that the, during the time I was there, there were probably no more than 10 or 12 cases per day. There are three operating rooms, but um, there is for some reason a lower surgical volume than could be utilized perhaps due to staffing availability in the OR. And that's definitely an area that could be improved. Um, there's also a general stigma within the community uh, and the patients to um, that they're a bit apprehensive towards medical professionals and receiving medical care. And um, this did stand out to me much more in Kumasi than in the other uh, countries that I visited during my fellowship. Um, I can recall, for example, there was an infant who had been diagnosed with bilateral retinoblastoma but was lost to follow up for four years. And when we spoke to the family about this, they said it was because they were apprehensive about the medical system. So that's definitely um, a weakness that can make uh, working in this area more challenging, but it is also going to be an opportunity uh, for improvement. Uh, in addition, I would say uh, the resident knowledge base uh, is a relative weakness, but it again is an opportunity for uh, teaching, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then there are limited resources in the, in um, this hospital. So for example, when I was there, the OCT machine was broken, but there wasn't anybody able to fix it during that entire month. Um, they also don't have a fluorescent angiography, even though there's a retina service. So I think um, having some of these technologies could be really helpful. And again, this is going to be another area um, for improvement. So in terms of the opportunities, there's definitely an opportunity for teaching, and I would say this applies to all subspecialties of ophthalmology. I have the chance to teach neuro-ophthalmology, but I think um, any, any skills within ophthalmology would be appreciated and warmly welcomed at CAF. Um, there's also an opportunity for patient education. As I mentioned, there's a stigma against um, healthcare. So educating the patient population on seeking care earlier and following up as advised would be really, really beneficial for the community. Um, a lot of times patients do present in end stages, for example, end stage IIH that have been um, present for years and the patient's now NLP or orbital masses that are um, so, so large, larger than I had ever seen before. Um, you know, these kinds of things, just encouraging patients to seek care when they first start to notice vision loss can make a huge impact in the community. There's also opportunities for research. They're working on curriculums to start teaching the residents about research now and uh, began the research process. But I think anybody that would be interested in collaborating with them on any research projects would also be very welcomed and it would be a great opportunity. 
There's also opportunities for improved uh, coordination of care uh, with the eye center and with the main hospital. So for patients that need uh, multi-specialty care, endocrinology, neurology, neurosurgery, et cetera, there, there's an opportunity to have a more streamlined system for the physicians within the various departments to communicate and make sure that the patient has comprehensive care. In terms of threats, um, I would say one is that there is a backlog of patients who need surgery, but the ORs are not able to have a substantial number of surgeries per day. So aligning this mis mismatch a bit better would help um, overcome this threat. Um, and along the similar lines, there's limited surgical exposure for trainees. So again, uh, maximizing OR usage and number of surgeries per day would be useful. Um, and lastly, there's a threat that some of the attendings are planning to spend more time in their private practice as opposed to the teaching hospital, which due to financial considerations, of course, um, can be understandable. So uh, somehow incentivizing people to stay in academia would also be uh, an opportunity uh, down the line. Um, and that's, again, going to be a more of a systemic issue that, of course, um, it doesn't have a quick fix. Moving on to Bugando Medical Center, this is in Mwanza, Tanzania, and I was there between January and March of this year. Some of the strengths of the um, program, I definitely noticed that the center was very well staffed. There were a lot of front desk staff, there were nurses in the clinic, there were um, scrub nurses, there's always people available to help. So it definitely didn't feel um, isolating in any way. And I felt like patients definitely had um, enough um, support uh, by the hospital employees. There's also a sufficient uh, amount of resources. For example, there's uh, preoperative testing. In addition to visual fields and OCT, there's IOL master. I felt that there was pretty much everything one would, a comprehensive ophthalmologist would need. And there's also a technician who performs these tests. They also have access to the intraoperative supplies um, that one would need for um, com complicated cataract surgeries, for example, malleugen rings, et cetera. There was, I didn't feel like there was a dearth of resources at Bugando itself. And then of course, post-operative care, they had glasses. I think that had been donated by Moran um, and things like that for the patients. So there was definitely a good amount of resources there. Um, also another strength is that the ophthalmology center is new. It's clean, well-kept, um, and that's definitely a plus. Um, and lastly, the patients, many patients are actually insured, which is definitely uh, a strength in terms of them having access to the medications they need, et cetera. And regarding uh, weaknesses, again, of course, some of these are related to larger systemic issues that is not in the control of the individual hospital per se, but it is important to note these. Um, one would be the cost and availability of testing. So serologies can be quite expensive. Obtaining neuroimaging can be quite expensive, especially for the patients that don't have insurance. Along the similar lines, um, surgery can be unaffordable for many patients. And uh, oftentimes the surgeons themselves pay for uh, the patients to have surgery. And in the outreaches, even when the cost of surgery is subsidized, uh, many patients in those rural areas cannot afford the surgery. So the purpose of the outreach is, is somewhat, um, you know, uh, it, it's not as uh, useful as it could be if the cost could be offset in some ways. And along with surgery, medications can also be quite expensive, especially for those that don't have insurance. So one way that I saw physicians work around this was by prescribing the medications under a different patient's name and then allowing that insurance to cover it. Um, so th there are ways that they're working around the system, but overall, um, having a better way for patients to access and afford care would be extremely beneficial. Um, similar to Kumasi, I feel that um, one of the weaknesses is the knowledge base of the physicians um, in being able to diagnose um, certain forms of vision loss or work, uh, work up um, vision loss in certain ways. And that would be an opportunity that we can that I'll talk about. Additionally, there isn't as many subspecialists in um, this hospital. For example, there isn't a cornea specialist. Uh, there's no one performing surgical retina at the moment. And unfortunately, the nearest centers are several hours away. So if someone has a retinal detachment, they have to go to Kilimanjaro, which is a five hour drive and people might not have access to transportation. So that does complicate things. Um, there is 
um, a relatively low surgical volume compared to the need within the area. Um, so there are people in the surrounding areas that need cataract surgery, for example, but they might not be being captured by Bugondo necessarily. Um, and that isn't, is going to be another opportunity for Bugondo. And then lastly, I also noticed that patients needed to be seen in clinic just for medication refills. And so this can make clinic volume quite high and can be, um, you know, create more work for the physician. So finding a way around this could also be uh, very useful. In terms of opportunities, there's an opportunity to create a residency program here. Um, they have a good range of pathology and uh, a, a sizable patient population. So there's definitely opportunity to um, make this a uh, teaching institution in, in ophthalmology itself. Uh, there's definitely opportunities for more teaching, just as I mentioned with Kumasi, um, for visiting instructors, practicing any subspecialty. I think they would be very uh, warmly welcomed here. Um, Regarding the surgical volume, there's opportunities to recruit patients from sites in the surrounding areas. Uh, for example, there's a government hospital nearby, and then there are obviously multiple rural areas. Having a streamlined method to capture those patients and bring them in to um, get the care that they need is definitely an opportunity. Just as I mentioned with Kumasi, there's also um, room for improved care with uh, physicians at the main hospital for patients that need multi-specialty care. There is also an opportunity to improve the way the health records are used. So they have electronic health records, but uh, it's not being used to thoroughly document the ophthalmic exam. And doing so would allow patients to have more um, better continuity of care and more thorough follow-up and um, better understanding of the history and what had been done so far. So definitely um, an opportunity to improve the way uh, things are documented and uh, maintained electronically. Surgical scheduling is also an area uh, that is also an opportunity uh, for improvement. So at the moment, patients are seen. If it's found that they need cataract surgery, they'll be admitted that night and then have surgery the following day. And while that works, especially for patients, uh, for example, who are coming from far away, um, there's also a potential opportunity to create more uh, set schedules where people can be booked uh, further in advance and come back for the surgery as an outpatient, for example. Um, and regarding organization, the outreach, at least the one that I went on, uh, I definitely see an opportunity for improved organization during the outreach so that more patients can be seen, more patients can have access to clinical or surgical care that they need. In terms of threats, um, as I mentioned, patients are admitted overnight to have cataract surgery. So this is a significant use of resources and um, might be uh, uh, cost efficient for the hospital to actually do these surgeries on an outpatient basis, at least for the ones who are in the area and can come back easily to the hospital. Um, so that's definitely, I would consider, I would consider that a threat. Um, in addition, there is a threat of missing di uh, ac accurate diagnoses or making incorrect diagnoses. And this is in part due to knowledge base, in part due to documentation, et cetera. And then lastly, um, there is a threat of having poor patient outcomes due to the cost factor, the cost of surgery, the cost of drops, the cost of um, serologic testing or neuroimaging, for example. So um, that is a threat that um, is something to be aware of. And of course, is a much larger issue than just um, the hospital itself. So uh, to wrap up, I'll quickly talk about some professional and personal takeaways from the year. Um, one of the uh, main takeaways that I had was that I really enjoyed uh, my experience teaching. I gave several lectures on uh, how to approach vision loss and topics in your ophthalmology, and I helped teach residents and students and, um, and the junior faculty in all of the sites, and this was a very fulfilling and enjoyable experience. I also really enjoyed the outreach experiences that I had in various sites. In Mexico, I did several outreaches, which were clinical, focused on screening. In Nepal, I participated in a, a large surgical outreach where over 200 patients had cataract surgery. And in Tanzania, um, I went on an outreach with uh, one of the attending physicians where we helped see patients and give them medical treatment, glasses, drops, and also perform surgery when needed. And all of these experiences were incredibly enriching and eye-opening. And then lastly, of course, um, the surgical skills that I developed and just generally understanding the patient pathology in all of these regions was um, 
uh, wonderful. Uh, I learned uh, about uh, how to do small incision cataract surgery, and I took the Help Me See simulation course when I was in Mexico. Then I had the opportunity to learn more hands-on at every other site that I went to. I also had the chance to continue doing strabismus surgery. And regarding clinical work, I helped with the consultations of many, many patients, especially those with neuroophthalmic disease or perhaps um, unclear etiology for their vision loss. And I found this to be really rewarding. Um, I learned so much from the patients that I was able to see there. And I learned so much from the other faculty and staff that worked at all of these sites. And it was, it was amazing. Uh, I would definitely recommend this type of fellowship to anyone who is interested and anyone with um, any given background within ophthalmology. It'll probably be one of the most uh, rewarding and exciting uh, experiences in your life, and it definitely was for me. So I give tremendous thanks to the Moran Global Outreach Team for having me um, and for allowing me to be part of this fellowship. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. What a fabulous presentation, particularly with your background as a neuro-ophthalmologist. One question I had for you is, you know, it can be discouraging not having the right tools to be able to do your job, to be able to have everything at your disposal. You mentioned some things in terms of lab workup and neuroimaging. What, how did you adapt to that? And what were some ways that you could still practice neuro-ophthalmology despite not having all the best technology at your disposal? So it really varies case to case, but um, using the clinical skills that you have to the best of your ability is going to be key. For example, if you suspect myasthenia, performing all clinical tests and treating if you have a high enough suspicion without obtaining serologies or EMGs, et cetera. So really honing in on your clinical skills. And um, that's something that I learned there. And in the other cases where you do suspect uh, uh, cranial pathology and you can't obtain imaging, there's not much you can do in those cases. Um, and I think this just shows us that we need uh, to find a larger way to help offset costs for some of these patients. You mentioned that you're also trained as a strabismus surgeon. What was that experience like? Did you find that the techniques that you had learned during your fellowship were similar around the world or similar to cataract surgery? Are there many ways to skin a cat, so to speak? Um, there were some differences, for example, in Mexico, and I'm told that this is how it is um, throughout Central and South America. They don't perform millimetric surgery. So they decide if the patient has a small, medium, or large angle deviation, and then they place the muscle either in front of the equator, at the equator, or behind the equator. They just estimate it. And I was only able to see patients post-op day one. I didn't have a long-term follow-up, but I'm told that the patients actually do well. So that was a major difference. Any questions for Aishwarya? Dr. Oh, and one more thing. Oh. Go ahead, Aishwarya. Oh, um, they're, when they pass the uh, sutures through the muscle and cut it off, they actually retie the suture together so that they can save it and don't need to open up a new suture for the other eye. So that was interesting. So I'll come to the microphone so you can hear me. So uh, what I often found is, as I was out is that uh, those areas that were willing to take care of people who couldn't afford full pay for cataract surgery were often sadly uh, not well staffed, often staffed by people who didn't have a lot of experience and very low volume, but it existed in the same countries, incredibly efficient, high volume, but they didn't take care of anybody who uh, couldn't afford to pay. Did you find the same in, in, for instance, in Africa when you were there, that they did have options that were high volume, but that when you're talking about a place where uh, that they can afford or, or would provide it for free, it just wasn't a mindset or people there that were prepared to do the kind of high volume surgery like we've taken for granted in places uh, like Arab and, and you know, Toganga, which are doing this extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not too sure because I'm not sure how the other sites in Ghana or Tanzania function. Um, but I, as I understand, for example, in Tilganga, they have a lot of uh, donations from nonprofit institutions that allow them to perform uh, outreaches for free. For example, that's what the physicians there told me. And I suppose that th those kinds of donations don't exist to the same degree um, in Ghana and Tanzania, or at least at Kumasi and um, Bugando. Yes, I think one of the things that you should appreciate is that the systems vary from location to location. I think one thing that Aravan has done very well is they've controlled the entire process. So 
that's how they're able to control their costs is they make the eye wells, they make the consumables, they employ the physicians, have the facilities. And I think that allows them tremendous amount of leverage to be able to care. Uh, but as Aishwari alluded to, much of the world still relies on NGOs and other uh, national organizations to help fund charitable care. Great. Aishwari, thank you so much. Yep. Enjoy your time in the Netherlands. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Our final presentation is also pre-recorded because Scylla Ball, our, our last global ophthalmology fellowship, who is still on duty, is in Chuuk, Micronesia with Lori McCoy and also working with our partner there, Padwick Gallen. So we'll be playing her presentation here in just a moment. Scylla comes by way of Drexel for her undergraduate degree. She did her MD and MPH at UPenn, followed by her residency in Cornea Fellowship at Mass High. Hi everyone, my name is Scylla Ball. For those of you that I haven't met yet, I am so sorry that I can't be there in person. I would have loved to give this talk live, but unfortunately I'm halfway across the world in Chuuk, Micronesia, um, doing what I am about to talk to everyone about. So I am one of the Global Ophthalmology Fellows this year, and I am going to share a little bit about what my year has looked like and some of the lessons that I've learned. So this is just an overarching timeline of the year. So I am part of the six month fellowship. It ended up being a little bit longer than that, but in that six month range. So November and December, I was in Nepal in Kathmandu and Hitauda. January and February, I was in Chuuk, which is part of the Federated States of Micronesia. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. March and April were really all over the place. So I started out March in Mwanza, Tanzania, and I spent the month of March there. And some of you may have already been there um, and some of you may be planning to go there in the future. And then April was kind of a conference month for me. I was in Boston for ASCRS. I was in D.C. Uh, for Mid-Year Forum. And then I had a very brief appearance at the Moran. I got to meet some of you. I got to see how beautiful the Moran is. And then I spent some time in El Salvador as part of a keratoplasty outreach. And now in May and June, actually in two days, I will be flying back to Chuuk actually and rounding out the year in Chuuk. So November started out in Kathmandu in Nepal and the left frame is myself and my husband with our host grandparents who were really just the most incredible people who would kind of cook for us, eat dinner with us every night. And then I would walk from where we were staying to Tilganga, that's the second picture, and that's the main Tilganga hospital. And it was, it was such a powerful experience because you're operating with a proctor. So I was with Dr. Joshi, who's one of their glaucoma faculty, and she would go through cases with me and just troubleshoot any, any issues with the case, teaching me how to manage complications, things like that, so that I was ready for the final panel, which is one of our high outreach camps. And from Kathmandu, I actually had the opportunity to spend time in Hetauda, which is one of the community hospitals, about four hours by car, actually more like five hours by car, I should say, from Kathmandu. And what was incredible about that is that I had the opportunity to go to two separate high volume outreach camps. And these are camps where we go to a village that's anywhere from four to five hours away from where we were. And so you can imagine how far out in, in the countryside that is. And we set up these surgical ORs. So we go in, the first location was in a school, the second one was like a community health outreach center. And we set up an OR and as the global fellow, either I have my own table, which was the case for one of the outreaches, or you share a table with one of their residents and you just move through SICS cases. But there's always someone in the room with you. So in, in both cases, there were two other surgeons plus our table and so if anything were to go wrong you have someone that you can talk to and what's so incredible about this is that each of Tilganga's community centers acts as kind of a spoke for the central hub in Kathmandu and they have basic equipment so here on the left you see the slit lamp so they have a slit lamp usually some sort of eye care and they have trained community health workers that can screen these patients that can take care of them post-operatively 
And then in the middle frame, you see our amazing team before the outreach, kind of having our opening ceremony. And then on the final panel, you see one of the patients. And this patient is so near and dear to my heart. He had just had cataract surgery. He was ecstatic. And I think it just speaks to the fact that these high volume camps, not only are they an incredible learning experience and an incredible surgical experience, but they're so valuable for our patients, even though we don't have the same stringent sterilization techniques as we might have at home. This is an opportunity to restore sight for people that thought that they may never have an opportunity and to really improve their quality of life. And I think that that is perfectly summarized here in this picture. So in January, I flew directly from Kathmandu to Chuuk, Micronesia. So Chuuk is one of four states in the Federated States of Micronesia. These are archipelago islands, so like a bunch of different islands in a lagoon surrounded by a reef. And each state has something like 20 to 30 islands, but they are separated by the vast Pacific Ocean. So you can imagine that getting from one state to the other is very difficult, generally cannot be done by boat and needs to be done by flight. The flights take anywhere from one to two hours and are very limited. So there is one ophthalmologist for all of FSM. His name is Dr. Padwick Gallen, and he lives in Panape. Panape is again an hour and a half or so from Chuuk. So the population of Chuuk really has to wait for someone to come there to be able to deliver eye care. And as you can imagine, during the COVID pandemic, they had almost no access to care, to any type of care. I mean, very, very limited. So right now they're kind of in the process of rebuilding the existing infrastructure that they had and providing care to as many patients as they can. And you can see that's me operating. This was a very special and unique experience in that given that I was the only ophthalmologist and that there were no eye care practitioners basically in the country. There's one nurse who does know some optometry, but other than that, no other aid. You are responsible for everything. So you are the pharmacist, the anesthesiologist, the scrub tech, the circulating nurse, your nurse, your own technician in the clinic. And so that's a, a really steep learning curve and one that I had to adjust to. But fortunately, we had a small grant through the ASCRS and we were able to conduct a community health worker training program. So we trained 11 people through this program and we trained them in basic ophthalmology skills. So how do you take a vision? How can you check the eye pressure? What are common pathologies that we see? And then in the final frame, this is us in just the absolute most breathtaking and serene environment, having a blast. I loved our team there. It was a really powerful experience. I was really there in February too. So I was there for two months and on the left, you can see this is one of my cataract surgery patients. She was really happy with her results, but her shirt says real queens fix each other's crowns. And I love that so much. I took this picture with her permission, but we had a very strong female team there as well. I think of the 11 community health workers that we trained, 10 of them were female or sorry, nine of them were females we had two men as part of the team and they loved it and it was just such a powerful experience but in the middle frame you can see me examining a little girl who has a very um, high prism diopter esotropia and and significant amblyopia as a result and so you have to remember that if you're the only ophthalmologist you are responsible for seeing everything and you really need to get comfortable with seeing a very diverse uh, caseload so that was something that i was also um, really excited to be part of because it was part of my residency training in our uh, eye emergency room at Mass Eye Near, and it was something that I was able to like actually translate into practice. And then in March, I was in Mwanza, Tanzania with our partner organization, Bugandu Medical Center. I know I keep saying this that I fell in love with this place, but I truly mean it. Each experience, each community that I worked with was so unique and so different, but also so fabulous. So um, in Mwanza, I was responsible for kind of training the local surgeons in FACO surgery and then performing SICS surgery. So you can see on the left, I have a cataract that we removed with SICS. Um, and then you can see pictures with the local surgeons and the patients. 
And then April was a busy month, like I mentioned. Here you can see me giving a talk at Mid-Year Forum. And then I was able to spend some time in El Salvador as part of a keratoplasty outreach. So we had, we brought corneal donor tissue through a foundation that I'm working with. And we were able to perform 15 penetrating keratoplasties for patients with chronic corneal scarring, which was a very powerful experience. But I want to Okay, so switching gears a little bit to my SWOT analysis for Nepal. Now, Nepal is a unique experience because you're working within a very established eye hospital. So the strengths are that you have a structured curriculum, you visit multiple sites, you get to be part of high volume camps, and that really gives you that experience. And you have a multidisciplinary team. Anything that you want or need, you have access to in terms of specialists. The weaknesses really were that there are so few spots for their trainees. So they have so many trainees from around the world for all types of specialties. So you really need to um, plan ahead to be part of that. And then a lot of the experience depends on the volume of the outreach. So I was fortunate that I got to take part in multiple outreaches and that gave me that confidence and that volume, but that's not always the case. So opportunities here, I would say, is planning ahead. Really, you want to plan at least a year in advance for this. The outreach camps tend to be clustered in November, December, and maybe partially January. So that's a good time of year to be there. So planning early and preparing ahead. And then threats. You have to be patient. You have to remember that you are a guest in a big institution and you need to just accept what is available while you're there and just be very mindful of that. Your skill level also depends on how many cases you will get. So just like any surgical training anywhere, if you are capable and confident, you will get more cases. Um, so really making sure that you're prepared, you know the steps, you know the complications, you at least know through watching YouTube videos or performing wet labs that you know how to manage some complications. Now, FSM is very different from Nepal, right? Nepal has the Tilganga Eye Institute, which is just this megalith of eye care. And FSM has one ophthalmologist and that ophthalmologist is not in Chuuk. So the strengths though, are that they have a lot of ophthalmology resources. So they have an excellent Zeiss slit lamp. Um, we have a motivated local team. They really wanna learn, they really wanna help. And the patients are really grateful. The weaknesses are that Dr. Padwick is far away and there's a lot of geographic isolation with these islands. Um, getting getting outreach to the smaller islands, even within one lagoon is extremely challenging. We're trying to um, do that this May and I will tell you it takes a lot of organization to go through. And then the pathology that you're seeing is often very advanced disease because of the limitations to access to care. The opportunities here really lie in the education. So how can we build capacity, transfer skills, and allow this to become a self-sustaining system? And the threats, the threats are really funding. Um, there is a compact between the United States and FSM that the United States provides them with funding in exchange for unrestricted military access to their waters. Now, that funding is now going through for the first time in several years. So I think once that goes through, that will allow us to have more consistency and outreach. And then personnel limits. The thing that really broke my heart is that their nurses are responsible for so much. So their OR nurses are responsible for all of the OR cases. They're on call Q2. They come in at all hours of the night due to emergency C-section. So they really don't have the personnel that they need to provide the care that they deserve to have. So addressing those issues would help tremendously in improving the quality of life of their patients. In conclusion, I want to end with something that I have repeated to myself many times this year, which is you don't know what you don't know until you know, or said much more eloquently than that by Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better Then, when you know better, do better. And Dr. Jeff Petty has quoted this more times than I can count, but it is so true. And this is really a fundamental part of global ophthalmology you're trying to do the best that you can with the resources that you have and as you learn you are becoming better and better and i have learned so much from each of the unique communities that i've had the opportunity to work with and to each of them i bring the knowledge that i learned from the previous community and that's what's so beautiful about this I always emphasize the importance of people, and I call these the ships, but really it's the relationships, the partnerships, the mentorship. 
I feel so fortunate to have met different people from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds that have taught me what it means to be a surgeon, how I should think about ophthalmology, life, my outlook, my personal life. Um, and so these are incredibly important. Diversity, we've hammered this home already. You're working in lots of different settings. You're expected to take on many different roles and you're going to see pathology that you have not seen stateside. And then growth. This year was such an opportunity for personal growth, whether that was on an intellectual level, an emotional level, or on a surgical level. There is so much to be said about putting yourself in extremely uncomfortable foreign settings. And that doesn't just mean foreign in terms of country, but just unknown to you. So even operating at Salt Lake City was a challenge for me because it was an OR I don't know, people I don't know. And so putting yourself in those positions, learning as much as you can and really pushing yourself is something that you you value more than you can imagine. So I'm extremely grateful and I just wanna end by thanking all of my mentors. I, I just want to end with my ships and these are my mentors. So I feel so unbelievably fortunate to have learned from all of the people in these slides and you know it's not enough to include everybody but these are some of the incredible mentors that I have in my life and not all of them are surgeons some of them are nurses some of them are our amazing outreach director Lori who has taught me so much but to have these mentors and to learn from these leaders in global health has been an absolute privilege so thank you all thank you for allowing me to share my experience and please don't hesitate to reach out